Hello, 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 hello out there, internets. How's everyone doing today? I see we have a few people already in chat. Excellent, excellent. So it is at the end of the week. We have made it to Friday. So <laughs> this week was a little bit tiring. I'm tired today. I, all Fridays are just usually end up just draining me towards the end of it. Uh, so we got some interesting stuff we're going to do today in today's stream. So we're going to handle this again as a Z Classroom kind of live thing. Um, where we're going to go in and focus on, say, like a user if they just picked up the trial and just go through some different things. Today we're going to be going over NanoMesh. So we're going to talk about uh, just briefly how NanoMesh works and then some reasons why would you use it, like some in-case scenarios. And then we're going to go into talking about alphas with transparency and then using NanoMesh with these alphas to create some kind of topiary effects. So there's a lot of things you can do with NanoMesh, and then if you add another element of them of transparency on top of it, you can create some really cool stuff um, inside of ZBrush. So give me a shout out if you all can hear me, and then uh, we'll get into the uh, nitty gritty of the stuff here. So first of all, we do have the trial of ZBrush 2020. It is available, so if you know anyone that's looking for something to do during the pandemic, they can definitely go grab the trial and try it out for 30 days. Uh, also, it's fully has all the full features in it. There's no restrictions. The only restriction is that it has a time limit. So after 30 days, it will cease to function. Um, you can download this for Mac OS and also uh, any Windows uh, machines, so Windows 10 and Mac OS. It will not work on an iPad, so if you have an iPad, the trial will not work on there. So it will not work with iOS, but it will work on a Mac machine and also a Windows machine. And ZBrush in general is going to use your CPU rather than your GPU, so you don't need to really have a extremely powerful computer to run ZBrush. Um, as long as you have a CPU, which all computers basically have, um, you'll be able to run ZBrush. And I've got it running on the lowest machine I have right now that I have it running on in order to test stuff or support scenarios is a Core 2 Duo. So that's a, it's a pretty ancient machine and I can launch ZBrush. It doesn't handle you know, as smooth as it does on a uh, better machine, but it will run and you can sculpt in it. So it's, it's definitely um, a program that will run on older hardware if you have it. So even if you have like say, parents, grandparents that are looking for something to do, send them to the trial page, download it, they can start messing with it on the machine. Also children, huge thing with that too, just for learning and I know my children are looking for tons of stuff to do during all this, so any, any outlet is a good outlet, so you can have them try ZBrush for 30 days. All right, so in addition to this, we have uh, other ways you can get into ZBrush. So a lot of people don't know we have monthly subscriptions. So we have monthly and then perpetual licenses. For our perpetual licenses, we've never charged for an upgrade. So if you bought ZBrush once, you've got free upgrades uh, for life so far that we have been doing here at Pixelogic. In addition to this, we also have our light version of ZBrush, which is called ZBrush Core. And this has a monthly price point. You can get it as $10 a month. It's the lowest cost point for that. And then we also have perpetual license on there. And there is an upgrade path from the perpetual to the full version. So just a few notes there in terms of the software itself. Also, what you all are doing, your uh, ZBrushing here using the trial, definitely use the hashtag ZBrush at home. So we've been following uh, this hashtag and just seeing what all you have been creating during the time here. So here's one that we've featured recently, uh, Doctor Strange that was done um, with the hashtag ZBrush at home. So definitely if you are doing anything, following along any of these streams, um, definitely uh, if you have Twitter, post your images up. We'd love to see them. All right, so let's see here. All right, so for today, we're going to get into the uh, initial topic of what is a uh, nano mesh and kind of how to use it. So to start off, I just have ZBrush here launched, and up at the top here, we have Lightbox. And Lightbox is going to allow you to browse different projects that ZBrush saves. And the one thing nice about this is that it will give you a little icon uh, for a, pre a preview icon for the model file. So you won't be able to do this natively in Windows, but if you can access a file inside of Lightbox, it will show you what's in that file. So it's, it's a handy little device here. And oftentimes I'll just copy or load files into the directories for Lightbox. If you hover over and click on anything, you're gonna get the directory of where that file is located. You can also make shortcuts in here. And if you make a shortcut um, from anywhere on your desktop and just place the shortcut in this, say, Z Projects folder here, it will show up as an 
a item you can click on and then it'll actually take you to that directory and then you'll get previews of your files in there too. So it's a handy little thing here with the light box. So today I'm going to just start off quickly with the primitives uh, ZPR file here and to load anything from Lightbox in just hover over it make sure it's highlighted and then double click and this will load it in and as soon as it's loaded in you're ready to sculpt so the model will be in 3D uh, you may have the floor grid active and then you can start manipulating your mesh. So for today we're going to talk about nano mesh and so if you're familiar with stuff inside of ZBrush there's insert meshes and there's nano meshes. And so for my cylinder here, let's say I have this and I'm going to go select a insert mesh brush, which I can just come over to the brush palette and open this up. And then here I'm just going to locate the IMM primitives brush here. Now an insert mesh brush inside of ZBrush is a brush that contains mesh parts. So it's insert mesh. And if it's IMM, it's going to stand for insert multi mesh. So that's why it's IMM because this brush contains multiple mesh parts. So I'm going to select the IMM Primitives brush, and when this loads in, you're going to get up here at the top a, what is inside of this brush. So these are all the different parts that are contained in this brush. And so if I come up here and select one of these, I can then go to my model, and instead of doing like a sculptural mark, basically you're going to be able to click and drag these parts out on your mesh. So as I do this, I'll be able to take that part I have selected, and then I'll be able to drag it out on my model. So this is a fun way to create different assets, play with silhouettes. Uh, it's kind of like a kit brushing procedure where you have like a bunch of parts and then you can draw them out to the surface of your mesh. Now, whatever one of these you have selected, when you draw it out, it's gonna fill or use that one. So as I had that cylinder extended, I got that. And if I switch to the sphere, I get this. And if I switch to the capsule, I get this. So you can use that um, to your advantage to create assets. Now with this, if you're populating something like this cylinder here, um, you could see that I could pretty much fill the entire cylinder with shapes. If I just came up here and just kept dragging this all the way across my model. So this would work. You could definitely, you know, flood the cylinder shape with these IMM parts. It's just going to take a little while because you have to do every single one pretty much by hand. So instead of doing that, we can use a process which is called nano mesh. And so I'm just going to undo this by hitting control Z to get back to my original mesh here. And Nano Mesh is a uh, subset of the Z Modeler brush. And what it's going to allow you to do, it's going to allow you to take one of these mesh parts and instead of drawing it on the surface of the model, you can go through and you can replace the surface with that model. So as an example of this, with my IMM Primitives brush selected, I need to convert this to a Nano Mesh brush. So the process to make a Nano Mesh brush is first you need to have an Insert Mesh brush and then you can convert that insert mesh brush to a nano mesh brush, and then you can use that functionality. Um, don't worry, I'll go through and demonstrate that process of the creation of all those steps here in a second. But just to briefly show you the difference, I'm just gonna come up here to this IMM Primitives brush. I'm gonna go to the brush palette, I'm gonna go to create, and in here I'm gonna click create nano mesh brush. So this is gonna take this insert mesh brush that has all these parts, and it's gonna convert it to a new Z modeler brush but now this C modeler brush has these parts installed into it. Now, when you have a brush with these parts installed, if I hover over one of these polys, you're gonna see that I'm gonna get the option of insert nano mesh a poly. And what this is now going to allow me to do, I can select one of these, and if I click and drag, you're gonna see first, it's gonna change the poly group in which that item has been generated on, and then it's going to insert this mesh into that poly area. So now this poly here is associated with this mesh. So it's instancing this mesh to this poly. And after you do this, if you go to the tool palette and open this up, you're gonna to go to the nano mesh area here. And in here we have indexes. So every time I drag one of these out, you're gonna see that a new index is gonna be created. So here's my first index, which is this one. And then I have index two, which is this one here. And then index three, which is this here. And this has now given me that these polys here are now assigned to these nano mesh parts. And once they are a nano mesh part, I can now use these sliders to control how they're going to be applied to that poly. Now, in addition to just doing single poly stuff like this, I can go through and I can fill the entire mesh with one single nano mesh index, which is usually the way you want to kind of work with it. So you can come through and apply this to, you know, single polys, but I want to fill the entire cylinder with this nano mesh. So I'm going to undo here and get back to my original cylinder here, like this. And now, instead of just clicking and dragging to 
drag out one of these. There's two ways you can kind of set the mode to a different format, which will allow you to target the entire mesh. The first way is that as you click and draw out, you can hold down the shift key on your keyboard. And this will now go through and apply that nano mesh to every single poly on the model. So this is usually the fastest way, especially if you've just created that nano mesh brush, you can hold down shift and drag it out, and then it's gonna flood the entire model with that nano mesh. Now the other way is you can change the target for this brush. So if you hover over a poly and press spacebar, you're gonna go into the Z Modeler poly action menu here. And the Z Modeler menu has a whole bunch of different things in. I did a whole uh, Z Classroom Live on some of these. Uh, there's also a uh, Z Classroom at Pixelogic's site that will go through and just has a video that goes over every single one of these actions uh, in the menu here. And there's a set of actions for polygons, there's a set of actions for edges, and there's a set of actions for points. So, but today we're not gonna go into all that, so don't get too overwhelmed with this. Uh, basically, we wanna keep our action on insert nano mesh, and then down here you can see our default action is a single poly. So we can change this to say all polygons, and now if we drag out on that one poly without holding shift, it's gonna go everywhere. So one thing with the Z Modeler brush is that these targets are going to come into play in importance if you're using it a lot because you can change how these actions are going to interact. So single poly was that first one, all polygons is everything. And then if I want to do something like flat island, this is going to look at the surface of the mesh and only apply that insert nano mesh to a flat area. So if I came across this area right here, since this is flat, so all the normals are basically flattened down, and if I click and drag that out with that, you see I'm now gonna be able just to apply that nano mesh to that area. So one little thing there on terms of applying nano mesh. So you have all your targets you can change to inside of the Z Modeler window here. And you can access this by hovering over a poly and pressing and holding spacebar on your keyboard. So I'm gonna to try to follow uh, chat here too. I, I have to look away and then I look back and look away and look back. So I'm going to try not to go on too many tangents, but if you have any questions on any things that I'm doing here, please put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them for you. So Jay, Jay's mentioning that he's tried to sculpt uh, Jessica Rabbit and uh, it did not go well. Anything in particular that you, you find did not go well? Um, there are some things that may be able to uh, you know, give you some feedback or tips on stuff um, if you had anything that you found worked and didn't work. I might be able to cover some of that here at the end of this uh, stream too. All right, so back here now. Okay, one more question. How did you change to a nano mesh? So you will first just want to select an insert mesh brush. So any insert mesh brush will work. And then after you have that brush selected, you then come up to the brush palette up here and do create nano mesh brush. Now you have to have an, an insert mesh brush selected in order for this button to activate. So you can see as I hover this over this, it's giving me this descriptive text of create nano mesh brush from the active insert mesh brush. So you have to go insert mesh to nano mesh because basically the nano mesh brush is just gonna look and see at all those mesh parts that the insert mesh brush has, and then it's gonna embed it into itself. And you're gonna get the nano mesh brush, which is basically a Z Mahler brush with all these pieces stored in it to be used with nano mesh. So another thing here, I'm just gonna populate the entire thing. So I'm just gonna use the shift process again. So I have my target set to a single poly. So I'm gonna click and drag and drag this out and hold down shift, which is gonna flood the entire surface with that nano mesh. Now, if you wanna populate another index, another nano mesh onto the entire surface of your model too, you can also do that as well. And so let's say I like this and this would give me one index, but then say I wanna add this capsule too. So I can select the capsule and if I draw it out normally, you'll see it's gonna replace the nano mesh that's on there. But if you wanna add it to it, um, you can also hold down that shift key again, and it's going to add that nano mesh to that area. So you can see now I've got two nano meshes on one poly. So I have two indexes that are associating with all the polygons on this model. And if you're gonna do complex things, uh, this is very handy because basically you can add layers of nano mesh onto the surface of your model and get really cool effects. So you can see now with this, I have two nano mesh index here. So I can scroll to zero one and I can just turn off the uh, hide others. So you can see this is my first index here. And then if I go to index two, this is my second one. So I've taken those two parts from this brush and I've applied it or I've linked it to all the polygons on it using nano mesh. So now that I have both of these, right? Now I can start modifying my nano mesh. So in here, after you have nano mesh active, you can change the size of this. You can change the width of this. 
You can change the length. And all this is doing is it's taking this object and it's instancing it basically on all the surfaces there. And then in here, you can now start playing with this. And so this is really cool for getting you know, different shapes, uh, randomness stuff that you may not, happy accidents uh, that you may not uh, have came across and modified on your own. And so there's some really cool things you can do with NanoMesh. And it's one of my, uh, kind of my favorite things inside of ZBrush in terms of just creativity, because you can get a lot of stuff out of it. And you can basically flood an entire model with a surface. And instead of sculpting that surface, you can just take a piece of geometry and flood it and get the surface detail you're looking for. Now, most of these sliders up here are pretty self-explanatory. They're going to change the sizes. You also can fit and fill to uh, the polygon borders too. So you can see now these are going to be longer because they're fitting into that area there. Um, so you can also change the, to clip the actual outside too. So if you had an extended uh, process on your mesh, it'll try to clip the stuff out. So there's all different things you can do up here with the nano mesh. Now, one of my favorite ones that I end up using a lot is this random distribution down here. And this will take the nano mesh index that you have applied and it's going to randomly place it on your mesh. So if you start moving this, you can see it's going to start randomly placing that insert mesh. And then you can keep going with this, but you can see now it's filled it with this really cool kind of pattern here. And then you can change your seeds on this to get a little bit more random. Um, but this is one I go to quite a bit just in terms of flooding geometry. Uh, surfaces with geometry. And so now I've created this kind of effect. And then you can always convert this to um, real mesh too. So you can definitely use nano mesh with say a solid object, nano mesh the heck out of something, convert it to geometry, use it with the Boolean system, and even print it out afterwards after it's all welded together. Um, so this one has the two indexes as well. So right now I have hide others on so I can expose that other index back and then I can switch to it up at the top here. And now I can modify this one too. So maybe I want to change the height on this and maybe the length a little bit. I can add some variation to this too and this will add a little bit of inconsistency. So bringing it to not be so computerized or perfect. And then I can mess with the scaling on this and I can even do that random distribution on that too. And you can see I can start layering this kind of stuff up. So now I have one nano mesh and then another nano mesh on top of it and it's still flooding the same mesh. Uh, so Randy is asking, does masking work? So we can only apply it to certain faces or, it's by, or is it polygroup color? So it's going to be all based on the polygrouping of your model. So if you want to apply it to specific areas, you can tag the same color polygroup to different spots and then it'll apply just to those polygroup areas. So it's all going to go based on polygrouping on your mesh. Augustus is asking, what's the best way to build base meshes for characters? So there's a ton of ways, Augustus. Um, the, pretty much the go-tos are usually, uh, for me currently, is you can uh, basically start base building with primitives and then weld those together with DynaMesh and get a shape and silhouette out that way. Or you can take just a sphere, switch to Sculptors Pro, and then start pulling meshes and forms out. Um, a lot of the streams that we do on our channel here will focus on more of that kind of character building stuff. And if you catch any of our ZBrush Live artists in their kind of base, uh, you know, starting out streams, uh, so definitely check out like Shane Olson and Ashley Adams. Um, they'll go through their uh, processes on how they start. And that's pretty much the main thing that they're going to start with the character and build out their base mesh and then detail it out and sculpt on it. Um, so I definitely check those out. Um, you could also check out the first time I did for the Z Classroom Live stuff that we started during this uh, pandemic and I'll go into sculpting a bust and kind of show you the Sculptors Pro method of that, which is really fluid. Uh, Yetkin's asking, how can you make snake scales with nano mesh and array mesh? So basically the same principle that I'm doing here. So you generate your snake body and then you could go through and take the index that you have and then just populate it with a scale. So you, instead of using one of these primitives up here, you take just a scale primitive and then put that on your model and you could populate all the surface. Now, one thing with Nano Mesh 2, if you're not using random distribution, it's going to be based on the topology of your model. So if you're doing a snake, you're gonna want that, the geometry to be pretty even all the way down the body. Um, Paul, who also does uh, streaming too here, he's, he's right here in this little pip. Um, he has a whole tutorial he's done uh, a few times on sculpting a snake tattoo. And he does the same thing where he has the snake bodies out, he uses nano mesh for a scale, and then populates the entire thing for it. So I definitely check, just doing a YouTube search for um, probably just Paul Snake, <laughs> ZBrush, you probably find it. Um, if not, he's going to be streaming, uh, 
I think Saturday he's going this week. So you can hop in there and ask him uh, to demo his snake process or point you in the direction of where the snake is. Uh, so digital planktons asking, can you convert nano mesh to sculptal geometry? Yes, you can. So as an example here, after I have this done, if I want to convert this, I can go to the geometry tab here and I can just simply click convert BPR to geo. And this is now going to take all those instances and now this is geometry. Now, of course, this may be a lot of geometry, but now you can see I can come in and sculpt on it and modify and change it up. And it's going to, you know, distort all those different uh, parts there. And you could also run this in the Boolean system. You know, you could make it turn into a Dynamesh. It's just geometry right now. And so all I did for that was come up here and do convert BPR geo. Now, there's another option you can use with um, Nanomesh 2. The one I like usually going to for converting the Nanomesh is this convert BPR geo. But you can also convert uh, individual indexes too. If you go to the Nanomesh tab and down here at the bottom, there's a one to mesh. And this will convert an index just to geometry. So you can just convert one. Um, so you can kind of do that process too. But the BPR Geo will do everything. So if you have a whole thing set up, you can just click one button and it'll process it all. So that's usually what I end up using. Uh, CT is asking, a returning sculptor is struggling with defining interest on a model. So CT, what I'd say uh, try to do is so we just did a, a whole stream for, on um, Geo. He did a ZBrush Master stream. I'd do a YouTube search for Geo ZBrush Masters, G-I-O. And uh, he'll go through how he deals with form and stuff inside of ZBrush. Uh, so that may help you out in terms of that. And then the biggest thing for me I'd say probably try is switch to, try like the snake hook brush and then turn on Sculptures Pro and you can start pulling out forms really easy. And it's, it, it's a fun kind of process. Uh, clay buildup will definitely work, but it's gonna be, it's gonna take you a while. I do a lot of like hash scrubbing as I do it. So I don't draw the stroke with clay buildup. I rather build it up. Um, and that seems to, for me, it helps me get the form where I want it a little bit better. But then using move and snake hook, you're able to kind of manipulate the forms and massage them a little bit more. So instead of sculpting them, you're kind of pulling them, which helps me um, often get shapes out. Uh, Julian Max asking, could you show this method for applying sculpted fur that doesn't look uniform? So for fur, uh, my recommendation for that, uh, Julian, would be to use the VDM brushes. And so those would be the brushes that live up here, these kind of chisel brushes here. Um, you can basically make a tuff of fur on a plane and then we can apply that and that tuff will be applied and it'll get a nice overhang on it. Um, Pablo Munez has a... Uh, whole thing that he's done on fur. If you search uh, ZBrush guides and fur VDM, I'd say do a search for that. And he's got a whole thing on that. And it's probably the best way that I'd say go with it um, is using VDMs for fur. For nano mesh, you can kind of do it, but it's gonna, I mean, it would give you the base form here. That you can kind of get where if you had a piece of geometry, you could definitely get something that would um, look somewhat like fur. Like if I take this, so, also with the nano meshes, you can always edit the part. So if you come over here and click edit mesh, it's gonna look at the index you have and you're gonna be able to get the geometry for that. And so as an example here, I can take this and we're gonna make a really nasty uh, hair tuff here. <laughs> this isn't gonna be pretty. So something like this, and I'm just smoothing this out, and it's kind of looking messy. I'd probably end up dynamishing this at some point, but let's pretend that's hair. <laughs> We're gonna pretend, and or fur rather. And now I'm gonna come back out of nano mesh, and now you'll see that this index now. Let me turn down my random distribution. Is all these little parts. So you could do something like this and you could change the size of this and then you could play with your rotations and offsets. You're not gonna be able to kind of get a brush look out of this. So that's one thing where if you had a VDM, you could have a little more control over it, but you could basically come in and start uh, using this kind of process of taking just a piece that looks kind of like hair and then um, applying it across your surface. Now, of course, this isn't probably gonna look all that great, but you could do something like this, but it's, the control is not going to be probably what you want. Um, so what I'd recommend doing was be using a VDM and doing the hair that way. Uh, SB Mongoose 
is asking if anyone has tried out the new Pablo Munez brushes that he made. He did do some fur brushes. Um, they're more for like kind of this kind of fur and facial fur. Um, but he has some really good ones for VDMs with the other ones too. But I have not tried them out yet. And Digital Plank is could you use nano mesh to instance leaves on a tree? Yes, you can. And that's where we're going to be going here soon. All right, so that's your brief rundown on nano mesh. Now let's put it in a practical sense here. So I'm going to load in two files here. So here we have a little coffee bean here. And then here we have a mug without my crazy keycher. Oh, you're, you're getting too far ahead of myself. Let's hide that. Without any crazy. Uh, bad sculpted creatures on it like I did last time, right? So I've got a mug and I've got a coffee bean. And as a practical usage of what you could do with nano mesh is you can take something and then populate it wherever you need it. So let's say I'm doing a scene or an image and I have this mug here and I want the mug to be filled with coffee beans, right? So I want to kind of look like it's filled with beans. So I'm going to come and first take this little uh, coffee bean here. And you can see I've also applied poly paint to this. So it's poly painted in color. So you can definitely use nano mesh with poly painting and with surfaces that have textures too. There's just two little things you need to turn on before you can actually get these things to show up after you apply them. Um, but with my little coffee bean here, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to create an insert mesh. And so I want to make sure that I have my bean positioned how I want it to draw out. Now you can have it you know, pretty much facing any direction inside ZBrush, but if you're making an insert mesh, the way it's facing you, when you draw on the surface of your model, that is how it's going to draw out. So I'm just gonna make sure my bean is facing like this, and then I'm gonna come over to the brush palette and do create insert mesh. And I'm gonna say yes to the new option. And so now I have an insert mesh brush that just contains this coffee bean. So now I can go to my mug, say, and I can just start, well, let me, let me delete my subdivisions first and I can start applying beans to my model. However, this once again, as we talked about earlier, it's gonna take a while, right? I'd have to fill up the entire cup with coffee beans and that I could be there for a while. So instead of doing that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate some temporary geometry, basically a plane object, and then I'm going to apply the beans to this plane and then I can now fill that plane with these beans and it's gonna generate the effect I'm looking for. So I'm gonna come over here to my tool palette and I'm just going to select a plain 3D object here. And any of the objects in here that have this appended 3D have this initialize menu. Well, most of them, the PolyMesh 3D star does not have the ability, but all the other 3D objects do. And I can now modify this mesh. So down here, this one has 33 divides going horizontal and 33 going vertical. So I'm gonna just lower this down some, maybe do 10 by 10. And now I just have this plain object. And now I need to convert this to a sculptable mesh by coming up here and clicking Make Poly Mesh 3D. And now I just have this plane. So now I have my insert mesh bean and I could, you know, once again, add these manually to the surface. It's gonna take a while, right? So instead of doing that, I'm going to convert my insert mesh to a nano mesh. So go to the brush palette again click Create Nano Mesh Brush, and now I have a Z-Modeler brush that has this part embedded into it for use with Nano Mesh. So now we talked, we had a question earlier about how this works with polygrouping. So I'm just gonna demonstrate this quick. So let's say I only wanna apply this bean to certain areas on my mesh. With the Z-Modeler brush or any Z-Modeler brush, if you hold down the Alt key and click and drag, this is going to assign temporary polygroups, okay? And this will allow you to perform an action, and the action is going to be applied to wherever you're clicking, then to whatever target's on, and then to also wherever has this temporary polygroup. So if I click and drag over here, I'm going to get a bean generated on this polygon, and then it's also going to put beans in these areas that contain that white polygroup. So I can click and drag and pull this out, and now you can see I've isolated polygroups just to that area on my model. So that is how you can use polygrouping and just say, hey, I only want this nano mesh to be applied there. Now you can get really crazy with this, and especially if you're trying to do some tiling patterns, uh, you may want to end up, say, doing something like this with your meshes, where you end up generating some sort of checkerboarding. So this is another way you can kind of handle uh, using nano mesh. It can come through and just quickly assign this white polygroup in a checkered format. And then now if I click and drag, you're gonna see I'm gonna get beans only in that checkered area. 
and then I could apply another nano mesh to the other areas on the model. So then I have kind of a contrast between nano, one nano mesh in one area and one nano mesh in the other. But the nano mesh system is all going to work on the poly grouping on your model. And then if you change the poly grouping, so if I come through and do a control W, which is going to reset the poly grouping, basically it's going to group mass clear mast. And so since I have nothing masked, it's going to apply just one poly group to everything. And you'll see as I apply that, my nano meshes are going to be disappearing. So the nano meshes are going to be linked to that poly group too. So one thing there. Uh, Randy's asking if you want multiple beans, but not all the facing the same way. Could you recapture it in different angles and add it to the IMM set? You definitely could, but if we just used this system here, basically I have just added the beans to one polygroup, and then I can add the beans to the other polygroup. And now I can just go to the nano mesh area here, and I have two indexes. So I've got index one, which has one set of beans, and index two, which has the other. And if I'm in index one, I can now rotate these one way. And then on the other one, I can rotate those, rotate those in a different direction. So you don't really have to change your insert mesh part. You just basically create another index with that same part, and then you can modify it. Um, so you can also apply a random rotation to stuff too. So that's what these random sliders over here will do. So if I have my Z rotation set and I do this, you're not going to see I'm going to get random rotation on those beans in that index. And you can mess with these with all these different rotation angles so you can get kind of some variation on this. So that is what I'd end up doing rather than going through and trying to uh, realign multiple beans. Now, if you have different bean styles, if you have ones that have like different, uh, say sculptural assets to them, then definitely creating those as uh, multiple insert mesh parts where the beans look different is going to add some more variation too. So now that I have my beans here, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna clear my poly group and apply these one more time just over everything. But this is with two indexes, so I have one set of beans and one set of another, and it's gonna be based on your poly groups. So I'm going to hit Control w to clear my polygroups, which is going to, as you see, remove all my nano mesh there. And now I'm going to apply the bean again. I'm going to hold down Shift as I drag this out. So I get one index across everything. So there I have the beans there. Now, if your mesh, if you activate poly painting, you'll see that it's going to turn on the poly painting that was stored in that nano mesh. So before it was just coming in as white. And now if I activate the poly painting on the subtool, you see now the beans are getting that color. So that is how you can set up a nano mesh brush to work with poly painting. You just need to make sure that the surface you're applying it on has poly painting active, and then that nano mesh's poly paint will turn on. And poly paint inside of ZBrush is just another word for vertex coloring. So now that I have my plane and I've got my nano mesh here, I'm gonna assign some random distribution here. And then I'm gonna come here and tweak these rotation sliders some and add some variants. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to hide my placement plane. So right now I can see this plane and I don't really want to see that. So I'm come here and turn that off. And now this will allow me just to see the beans as themselves. So now I'm going to take my plane and I'm going to move it over to my mug. So I'm going to go to my mug scene. Actually, I'm going to bring, we'll bring my mug over here. So we'll pen the mug. So to do this, I just went to the tool palette, subtool area. Here is my object or my subtool with the nano mesh applied. And then I'm going to click Append and bring over my mug. So there's my mug there. My mug's going in this direction. My nano mesh plane's going in that direction. So we need to rotate one of these. So with nano mesh, remember that it's just going to be linking to a poly. So wherever that poly goes in space, the nano mesh is going to go too. So what I can do is I can just move this plane. So I'm moving this to the plane geometry. And I can rotate this, and I can reposition it. And those nano meshes are going to follow that geometry. So this is really handy because now I can position these and move and scale them and rotate them and position them in my cup. And then in addition to this, I can now sculpt or move the vertices of that plane and those nano meshes are going to follow it. So if I turn off the nano mesh quick, this is all this object is, right? It's just a plane object. So if I switch to the move brush by hitting B, M, and V on my keyboard and I start manipulating the surface here. All I'm doing is just distorting it, right? So I'm just moving it in space. So I'm moving it maybe tucking into the lip here some, and that's all I'm changing, right? But when I change that, the nano mesh is following, right? It's following that surface. So you see, as I start distorting this, 
I can now make it look like the beans are like shooting off the edge, right? And because they're still stuck to that plane object, however, now I'm moving that plane object and now the beans are going crazy, right? So if I can turn on show placement, you can see what I'm doing to the geometry. So I'm just moving this around, right? And the nano mesh is following it. So you can make some really cool dynamic stuff out of this just using nano meshes, right? And then I can still modify all this. So I can modify the size of this, make these beans larger and smaller. I can increase the random distribution. So now I've got a whole like crazy mountain of beans, right? I can adjust the random seed and you can just start playing with these things and start generating different assets uh, to your models. So things that would take a really long time, you can just take a piece of geometry, position it how you want it, and then flood it with geometry. Let me look at these questions here. So Rue is asking, someone said that, that I was the person to ask about Z-scripting. I may be. <laughs> Marcus is the other person. One of us, too, will probably have an answer for you if you have a question. Uh, yep, Sade's bringing up the Yes Nano Mesh is very good for chain mail. It will also work like really well like that. Web Etching is asking, well, what if I want to remove one bean? So if you have this random distribution set up, it's kind of just going to randomly follow it. But let's go back to no random distribution. And this is giving me one bean generated on every poly. So let's say I want to remove this one right here, right? Maybe I don't want this bean. Actually, we'll do this one. I don't want this bean here. So to remove it, we just need to change the poly group on that object, right? So I can go back to my Z model brush with the nano mesh in it. And I can hover over that poly there. I can press space guard, go in the Z modeler poly action menu. In here, I can choose poly group and make sure my target is single poly. And as soon as I change the poly group on that, it's going to break the link from that nano mesh to that poly. Okay. So here it has the bean. And if I click, the bean is now gone. Okay. So that's all you have to do to kind of remove beans from the area. If you want to keep the nano mesh active, that's the best way. You just change the poly group and it's going to remove any of those beans linked to that poly group. Okay, so now I see those are gone. Now, the other way you can get rid of beans is if you're happy with the way it is, you can now convert it to geometry and then simply just delete that bean. So that's the other one there. But you will end up uh, converting your uh, nano mesh to true geometry. So right now it's still in kind of this organic mode where I can move it around and distort it and change it. And it's not set in stone. As soon as you convert it to geometry, all these are going to be locked in. So you'd have to go through and manipulate them manually again if you want to make any large changes. A few more questions here. Where does ZBrush store custom menus? So Giovanni, there is a ZBrush data 2020 folder that lives in your C users document folder there. Uh, there'll be an interface area in there that will have it. Uh, unless you've cleared that folder, it should not have gone away. The other thing with custom user interfaces, if you go to preferences and you go to interface, uh, where is it, config, you can save and load your UI right here too. So if you have a version you've saved out, you set where that goes. Um, so you can definitely do that and then you can load it back in. But you would have to actually do a little bit of work to go and find your uh, user's directory or basically uninstall ZBrush um, for that custom UI to go away. So i um, not really sure what happened there in terms of that, but if you do notice it again, I'd suggest coming to the help option up here and submit a ticket to uh, our support site. So if you click this here, it'll take, us, take you to support.pixelogic.com and then you can submit a ticket and we can definitely uh, look into it. So Randy's saying, you notice when we scaled my plane, the nano mesh size did not change. Yes, so currently right now, if I move this, the nano mesh isn't changing size. And that's because it's over here and it's set to proportional mode. If I change this to fit or fill, it's going to look at the topology of the mesh. So if I make these polygons larger and smaller, the nano mesh is going to be larger or smaller. So that's one of the options here with this. And so the proportional one is only going to change unless it's only going to change if you change the slider here and then fit or fill it will still look at the slider but it's going to base the size on the to polygon so you can see as i've started deforming that polygon right through there you see these are all stretched and that's because the polygon itself is stretched so you can mess with these little sliders here to see how those are going to actually interact there uh, 
so Stick is asking, how can you use nano mesh to go in one direction without overlapping or uneven mesh? So the nano mesh is always going to file geometry. So if your mesh is overlapping or uneven, it's definitely going to just give you man nano meshes in the same way. So you just want to make sure if you want to use it on, say, one part of a mesh, you can always just create a proxy mesh, right? So instead of, if you have a character and he's really dense or his topology is good for the sculpting aspects but not good for nano mesh, just make a duplicate of him, run him through Ziri Mesher, uh, set up some new topology on the area you want, and then apply nano mesh to that area, and then just use this slow plate show placement option right here and just turn it off. And then you'll get that nano mesh you want on that good geometry for nano mesh, but then you'll still have your other model underneath. So don't think that you have to use nano mesh on your sculpted object. You can always create dummy objects, dummy shapes, and use nano mesh on that shape, which you can make the topology whatever you want it to be, and then that can be applied to your mesh. So you can always go that route too. Uh, Mandresh is asking, is there a way to not let the beans intersect? So not uh, unless you do it manually. So basically all it's doing is it's coming across the geometry that you have and it's applying it. So there's no simulation properties here, it's just populating the mesh. So if you see any kind of beans that are intersecting, you'd have to go in and say manipulate them, um, make the polygon spacing larger, you can decrease the size of it, which would um, minimize that happening too, but you're gonna have to just go in and manually fix that. There's no simulation for a collision in terms of nano mesh. Now, one thing you can do too, is you can also duplicate the nano mesh too. So say I want this, I like this one, but maybe I wanna you know, modify it again. So I can simply duplicate that nano mesh subtool, and now I can manipulate this one, and now I have two, right? So now I can make, you know, like the, the vortex of coffee beans, right? And now it's gonna be like, ah, right? So <laughs> there's all sorts of things you can do because all it's doing is just using topology. So you can definitely can play with the forms pretty well. So Augustus is asking, is there a course on NanoMesh? So I can't remember, I may have one on Z Classroom. Um, I've done a few uh, just presentations on it mostly than anything else, but it's really, the main thing is applying it and then just manipulating it with the sliders. And I will go over some more uh, nanomesh stuff here. I'm gonna show you a few more examples and then we'll go into using it for uh, foliage too. Uh, Div Yang is asking what's the best pressure sensitivity for sculpting? Um, I usually leave it whatever the defaults are. Um, so it's, I just have a Wacom, you know, I have use a Cintiq at my, uh, on my desktop and then for streaming here I have a uh, Wacom tablet. I just use the defaults and then with them I just have a your standard into his pen and it's just whatever I, whatever pressure it's set to by default feels fine for me. So if I press hard it's going to, you know, give me a larger or a more intense stroke and then if I go real light it's going to give me a soft stroke. But I don't go in and modify any of my, um, pressure sensitivity settings. As long as it's giving me pressure sensitivity, I usually just go along with it. Uh, I'm reading some of these questions here. So Damon, your questions, I'm not fully sure uh, what you're kind of looking to do. Do you have an example or an image you could post? Maybe we could look at it like that. I can see if I can help you there. <laughs> Bert's saying that he wants to know what it feels like to be me when I grow up. I'm still working on growing up. <laughs> I haven't got there yet. And look, thank you, Mongoose. There is a Z Classroom tutorial. It's probably me. <laughs> um, so Randy's asking, once it's converted, can I select the beans individually? Yes, you can. So as an example, let's take one of these. This set here. And we'll go to the geometry, we'll do convert BPR to geo. This is the result I get. And so you can see by default, none of them are gonna be welded. So they're all gonna be separate geometry meshes. Uh, the placement object is also gonna come. So if you don't want that, you're gonna have to hold control and shift and get the select rectangle brush and then isolate that and click it again to hide it. And then we can go to tool, geometry, modify topology and delete hidden. And that's gonna remove our placement grid. And now each one of these beans are individual, okay? So I can come down here to the tool polygroups area and do an auto groups, which is gonna go through and it's gonna look at all the geometry islands and give me a new polygroup for every single one. So after I do that, you see now I have all my beans are different polygroups. And so we were talking about earlier, like moving them or deleting them. 
Um, after you have them set with different poly groups, you can come over to the brush palette over here, and I just have the move brush selected, and you can go to auto masking and turn on mask by poly groups. And now whatever you click on, it's going to just move that one. So you could actually come through, you know, pretty quickly after they're converted. And if you see anything that's kind of embedded, all I'm doing is coming through and just moving these. And if you have your intensity for this set to 100, it'll do this kind of screen space move. So it's not going to warp them. So this is pretty fast to come in and start, you know, moving these beans in screen space just so they're not intersecting all over the place. And the option for that is in, it's any brush will do this. Um, I'm just using the move brush here. And you want to go to brush auto masking and then turn on mask by polygroups. And then if you have your intensity set to 100 with the move brush, you're going to get this kind of move effect. So it's not going to deform the beam. It's just going to basically change its position. And then now I can come through and reposition these very quickly. And so now I have all those beans out, and then I can turn off my polyframes and turn back on my mug there. I can find my mug. And now I have those beans like that. And so then I can come through still and you know pull these off the edge if they're intersecting. So that is what you can do after you've converted it. But once again, I, it's no longer a nano mesh. This is all geometry right now. So if I wanted to do large changes, I'd have to manually do it. So I hope that answers that question there. So Mongoose is asking about the core stuff. So I'm not sure if, I'm not sure where the, uh, there's been a bunch of ZBrush cores, so there may just be the, a website which doesn't really have stuff updated, so that coming soon may just be a bad web link, possibly. Um, if you don't mind, can you, I'll have you submit a support ticket too. Just come up here and go to uh, help, uh, Pixelogic support, and just uh, send us that information too, and they'll help. All right, so now I'm gonna show you guys a few more examples of usages with nano mesh that I find pretty cool. So here I have a bridge example. So this is one I did um, for when we released the uh, nano mesh kind of functionality stuff. And if I come across these, we'll just isolate the bridge here first. And I'm just gonna turn off the nano meshes here. Here is my initial geometry for this. Let me just turn this on. So you can see this is very, very simple, right? So this is just done with the Z-Modeler brush. It's very, very simplistic geometry. And you can see it has this polygroup breakup, right? So I have different color polygroups happening across the mesh. Now with this broken up, if I come up here and now activate nano mesh, I have nano meshes on the different parts of there. So I have multiple indexes. And if I just kind of go through these, so I have this wood index. So this is just a board I sculpted really quick. I decimated it down and then I've just applied it across everything. I then have some rocks. So these are like some internal rocks here. I have some little stones, and then I have some more rocks, and that's all the instances. So there's four indexes on here, and that's giving me this kind of look now with the surface. Now with this, nothing with you know the nano mesh stuff, is that it's gonna follow the surface I use this, and if you have that random distribution on there, as you sculpt or move the surface, it's gonna add more parts. So this is really cool if you're doing like environment stuff. So I can come through and say, hey, the bridge got hit by a rock, right? Or you know, a cannon blasted it or a catapult threw something at it, right? So I can just take the move brush and turn my intensity down back from that 100. And I can just click and drag and you can see I'm deforming that surface there. And you can see it's changing or adding geometry as I stretch this out. So now I've just gone through and I've just modified this bridge and I don't have to repopulate anything. I don't have to re-sculpt anything. I'm just moving it and it's tailoring that nano mesh to that surface. So this is really cool for creating different environment accesses, right? So I can come through and just click and drag and just change the surface, maybe manipulate the edges and get some randomness, some things that it might've been you know, caused by destruction or just decay. And it's all gonna get updated with the nano mesh. And that's the same thing, like I have some land mass uh, tool here that's just this grass. And this grass is just planes of geometry uh, that I've used in nano mesh form and it's just added them across the surface. But I can manipulate these and move them around and kind of tailor how that grass is happening. And all I'm moving is this simple um, plane geometry, 
right? So this is, this is all that is. That's all the surfaces that that grass is populating. So the rocks are populating the red areas and then the grass is populating the green. And that's giving me that there. And then things such as the water is the same thing as well. So if I just solo that, you can see it's just a nano mesh that has been applied across, turn on my polyframes here. I can show you what that looks like, there you go. So I just made this, so that's my water droplet. And then I've just applied it across those polygons there. And now it's given me this kind of rippled surface for water. So you can use nano mesh in that way too to generate surface details that you may not have. And I've gone through and populated like entire <laughs> buildings with like wood texturing. And all I did was just make a simple wood texture shape and just applied it with the nano mesh. And then it gives me the appearance of wood. So instead of sculpting it all out, I'm just uh, going through and doing it. So digital planks, how are you getting the wood planks to be at 90 degrees? So it's just the settings in here, whatever you change them to. So if I go to my bridge part here, let me find which index that is. So I have some offset values. Uh, these are changing the height, but I'm only offsetting in one uh, Z here. And so Z is doing that. My rotations are all zero. So they're all coming into one direction uh, for the most part. Now, the other thing with uh, nano mesh is it's going to align based on a few things. Um, so we have in this alignment tab here, you have some different ways you can align your mesh. So they're all going horizontally because that's basically how I created the insert mesh part. So I created it drawing out like that. So when I apply it, if I don't have any rotation stuff set over here, it should follow the same way as an insert mesh would draw out. So it's gonna follow that same direction. And then the other order, which is giving me this kind of uh, left and right chaos, is set by this alignment. So if you change these, you can see how much this is just going to change how that bridge is going to generate. So if I do something like near edge or long edge, or near edge or point order, you see they're now gonna be all going this way. And then I could scale these you know, size here, I could turn down the render distribution, and I could start getting the more, more like probably a plausible bridge where they all be having the spans going the same way. But if you change the alignment, then you can start seeing how this is gonna get a little more chaotic. And so now I've got this kind of thing going where and some, some woodcrafter was very skilled and he came in and he, he just angled these beams perfectly and just got that shape after the bridge was destroyed. So you can play with the alignment options here. Um, there's also uh, some options which control how the nano mesh goes and that's uh, determined by the edge spinning. So basically, each face has a certain order in terms of its uh, vertices. So if you think about like a square, right, you'd have two triangles that would make it up, and then you have a point order. So it'd be like one, two, three, four. So if it's one, two, three, four, the nano mesh is going to go one way. If it's four, one, two, three, it's going to go another way, right? So the order of your vertices are going to determine how that nano mesh sits on the surface. And this is a byproduct of um, Micromesh, which was what originally nanomesh, nanomesh is like a version of micromesh inside a ZBrush that's on like steroids. So it's the hyped up version, more things to play with. Um, and with that, you can see in the tool geometry modified topology area here, you have this micromesh button and directly next to this, you have spin edge. And so this will allow you to control those vertices and how they're going per each edge. And so you can see as I change this, even I'm not changing any alignment down here, it's going to change how that's gonna happen. So there's a whole uh, set of videos on, um, I think some nanomesh stuff where I actually go through on Z Classroom where I generate a uh, cowl for a um, soldier. So basically like a ghillie mesh suit, but it's only like the top part. And I'll go through and I explain some of the spin edge stuff on how it generates the form there. There's also a Z Classroom video on using the Z Mahler action spin edge. So if I, just solo here. You can also spin edges by, there's a one right here, a spin edge option. And this will allow you to do clockwise or counterclockwise. And so you can control just a single poly and spin it. The one over here in the modified topology is gonna be a global based on what you have visible. So if you have parts of your model visible and you spin the edge, it's gonna spin everything. Um, but there's a Z Classroom video on that. It's, that gets a little bit complex in terms of spinning edges, but that's how you can control exactly how the position of those nano meshes are gonna flow on the model. <laughs> May have been too much information there. Now, Randy, the, the, uh, Randy's asking, you thought the grass was fiber mesh? No, it's, it's all uh, nano mesh. 
Uh, digital planking exactly what's the difference between a ray mesh and nano mesh? So nano mesh is going to all be based on the surface, a uh, poly surface of your model. So it's taking a primitive and it's applying it to a surface. Uh, a ray mesh is going to generate instance geometry, but it's going to be doing it based on arrays. And so it's basically doing it on a slider based spline that controls how the topology is going to flow. So they're, they're really totally different. Um, you can also convert array meshes to nano mesh, but you can't go the other way around. Um, but nano mesh, in, in my usage of it, I use it a lot for um, just playing and, and uh, I, th I think it has more uh, flexibility than some of the array mesh stuff. Like I use array meshes to take an object and mirror it around in a circle. That's my primary use of array mesh, but for nano mesh, I use it all over the place. Um, another thing with nano mesh, let's just do this one quick too, is I'm going to go back to plain 3D here. I'm going to set my divides back down low and then convert this to a poly mesh. We're going to get my bean brush here. Um, here's one thing too that's pretty cool. So I'm going to come through and just insert nano mesh across everything. And then Let's say I'm going to delete some polygons here. So I'm hovering over poly, I'm using the Z Modeler brush. There's a delete action. I'm just gonna delete a hole. And this is gonna give me an isolated poly, right? So now I've gone through and I'm holding control and just dragging out a mask. If I hold down Alt, this is gonna allow me to apply masking to everything else that's not masked. And so now this is unmasked there. And then take the gizmo and use go to unmask mesh center. And now I can move this bean around. So I'm moving one bean. Now, the cool thing about this is that since nano mesh is based on polys, you could basically take an object, apply a nano mesh to it, and then you could populate it elsewhere. So say you have a grenade that you've made, right? Take that grenade, turn it to an insert mesh brush, turn it to a nano mesh brush, apply it to a single plane, just like this bean here. Then I can now take that plane and move it everywhere I want and that grenade's going to follow it, right? So I could put one here and I can put one here and I can put one here. And after you have that poly group set, I can now duplicate this. So I'm holding down control and I'm just duplicating the unmasked parts. So now I've taken and made two beans, now I can make three beans, four beans, five beans, six beans. And all I'm doing here is duplicating that poly. And since that poly has that same poly group that that nano mesh is linked to, I can now manipulate it. So now I could have say a bean right here. And then I could come in and grab this one, go to Unmask Mesh Center, have a bean here. And so you can see it's, it gives you this kind of endless possibility where you can just add a single poly to anywhere in your model and it'll copy or make an instance of that shape. Um, and then in here I can turn off Show Placement and now I just have all these little beans. And these are all just on the single polys and I can go back to my Move Brush here, set my intensity high again, and now I can move just these polygons. Well, I should be able to move these polygons if I'm unmasked. And then I'll manipulate them like that. So cool thing there, just using nano mesh too. And it's, it's great for instancing. The only downside on nano mesh, well, it's not really a downside, just a restriction, um, is that if I want to edit the beam topology, in order to edit it, I can't edit it up here. And this is one difference between nano mesh and array. Array mesh is going to allow you to edit that starting array mesh, and then it's, you're going to see it updated across everything. For nano mesh, this is taking the geometry and it's locked in right now. So the only thing I can manipulate is the polygon or the surface that nano mesh is connected to. However, if I want to edit it, I need to come over here and go to edit mesh, and then this will show me that object by itself. However, when you're in this view, you're only going to be able to see this object. You aren't going to be able to see it as a whole. So if you had a grenade and you placed it on a bunch of, placed it on a plane object with nano mesh and you moved it around your character so you had multiples. If you want to edit that grenade, you're going to have to use edit mesh over here. And this is now going to isolate it and show you just that grenade. But you're not going to be able to see that gray grenade related to everything else until you get out of edit mesh. So just one little thing there. I, I'm going way overboard on tangents and we're, we're hyping it up to skill level 10. <laughs> so that may be too much. Um, I'll, I'll try to tone it back here some. So yes, Randy, uh, micro mesh, um, nano mesh is the advanced version of micro mesh. That is correct. Uh, Rio's asking, can you add decorative finish to a jewelry design with this? Um, you could, you could definitely generate a surface, populate it with nano mesh. And then uh, after it's done, you just convert it to real geometry using that 
convert BPR to geo. And then to get it to watertight, you could use the Gizmo 3D um, remesh by Union, and that would go through and weld them all together. So you definitely could do that. Uh, so web etching, yes, all these polys right here, it's going to be based on your poly group. So these polys are all this, have the same poly group, so that index is linked to that poly group. As soon as I would come in and say change the poly group, you see it's going to remove it from there. So that link is going to be broken. Um, you can also copy poly groups with um, the ZMeller brush too. So if I select back to the ZMeller brush, so say I accidentally cleared that one out, right? So this poly group's different from this one now. I can come over a poly that has the poly group I want. I can go in here and choose the poly group option in the ZMeller poly menu. And then down here, I can do pick existing instead of overwrite. And now it will pick it. And now if I come across the surface I want, change it to overwrite. And you can see as this poly group change, changes back, that bean's gonna come back up. So you can copy the poly group too. So yes, this, this grenade, we were talking about grenades, but this is definitely a, a coffee bean. <laughs> I, had a, I should have brought a grenade. We could have we went and uh, covered that. Next time, next time. We'll blame it on preparation. All right, so now we're gonna have some, we're gonna talk about alphas quick, and then we're gonna use our newfound love for nano mesh, and we're going to generate some cool stuff. All right, so I just reset my whole thing here. I lost all my coffee beans, lost everything. It's all gone, it's all gone. All right, so what I wanna do now is I'm gonna talk briefly how ZBrush handles texture stuff. And so as an example of this, I've just loaded this sphere in and up here we go to the tool palette and I'm just gonna grab our trusty plain 3D object here. I'm gonna go down to the initialize menu and just make this a little lighter. So 10 by 10, and then we're gonna convert it to a poly mesh 3D. Now inside of ZBrush, if you have a texture map and you apply it to the surface, um, it's gonna bring it in and Anything that has like a pure black color, you're gonna be able to use as a translucent or um, opacity kind of thing. So if you think about like a PNG that has like a native uh, alpha channel kind of built into it, ZBrush isn't gonna accept that kind of stuff, but it will take any texture you have, and if there's pure black, you can turn that black into transparent. So as an example, with just this plain 3D object here, if I come over to the texture map area, you can see there's these textures 10, texture 11, and texture 12. And these are set up as RGB. So you can see their depth is just, it's just an RGB map, 1024 by 1024. And there's no alpha built into this map. It's just a colored texture. So it's just a texture that has the star on it and then the background is black. Now you'll see when I hover over it, that black area is rendering as transparent, right? So if I select this here, you see this is what's gonna happen. So I've just taken that star and I've applied it to the plane and now I'm only getting the plane or the star, right? This plane is still here. So if I turn this transparent option and texture off, this is what the, it looks like, right? This is the pure texture map here. So you can see it's a star and then it has this black background. And then the texture map tab, if I sent this to transparent, it's now gonna call out that and now I have a transparent surface. Now with this, I can come down to say the display properties too and turn on double and now you can see I have this plain 3D and it's now being culled out by this texture of this star. So this is a little thing to note with the process we're about to do. So we're gonna take the star, we're gonna take maps that are like this, they're set up in RGB format and they have black backgrounds and we're gonna cull those out and then we're gonna apply them to a mesh using nano mesh, which is then gonna give us some crazy results and give us the ability to kind of modify uh, surfaces that aren't as heavy and make them look heavy. <laughs> so like the star here, just the ability of just clipping this out by this texture map, I've now added more kind of dynamic or uh, dynamic qualities or uh, resolution to this. So if I turn this you know, off, you know, I just have a plane. But when I turn it on, this transparent process is making this more interesting. So it's adding more detail to that surface. Now this can be applied to a really low polygon version two and it's still gonna work. So right now I just did a 10 by 10 plane, but if I come up here to that plane 3D option again and let's go all the way down to the lowest, so two by two, and then make poly mesh. And I'm gonna do the same thing 
Now I'm going to take that texture map, and so now this is going to work as well. And so now this poly right here is extremely lightweight, right? So we're looking at four active uh, points here. We're looking at two triangles, and then I've added this texture map, which is adding complexity to it. So this is another way you can kind of use alphas. Um, this is pretty much only going to be able to be used in like a render format. You're not going to be able to do anything with this in terms of like uh, 3D printing or generating a pure mesh out of it. But for any rendering processes, um, compositing, anything of that nature, you can take alphas and add them to surfaces, call out parts of them, and you're going to get a more advanced surface, but you're going to have it still be lightweight so you can use more of them. <laughs> okay. So with my star here, I got that. Now with this, I have gone through and I have made a bunch of alphas. So let's go and locate my texture folder here. Now you guys, unfortunately, I do not have these anywhere where you can get them. Um, so you're gonna have to, you have to make your own probably, or I'm gonna have to eventually upload these somewhere. So here's a bunch of foliage. And so basically what I did here was I went around and I carried around this gigantic green screen and I would put it on, I would get some random trees out of the forest, random plants out of the forest. I'd put them on top of the green screen and I'd take their picture. Then I'd take these images and I'd bring them into Photoshop and I'd clean them up so they were left with just the image of the uh, plant, basically their leaves and stuff, and then nothing else. And most of these are most of these are pretty big, so uh, I have some of these with, listed with their K values. So at least 1024 um, are pretty much the majority of these. I have some 2Ks, and I think I have some 4Ks in here too. And yes, it's totally from my backyard. <laughs> it's never gonna die. And so I have a whole bunch of these in here. And so what I can do with these is I can start playing with these to start generating designs. So I can take these and start populating different meshes and filling them with this, and now I'm gonna get a different result. So to load any of these in, I can just come across the surface here and say, we'll start with, uh, say this one here, and just double click. This is going to now put it into the texture tab here. And then after that's in the texture tab, I can come over here and switch to it, and now I have it like this. So now I have a single poly, right? Talking two triangles here, and now it looks like a leaf, okay? So now I can manipulate this and this is just doing that same process I did before. I'm holding control and duplicating it. And you can see I can start, you know, making some sort of plant life, right? And it's gonna be just those single polys. So if I turn off the textures, this is all the geometry is. And then when I turn it on, it now looks like this. Uh, there's also anti-aliasing, yes, and the anti-aliasing will clean it up quite a bit, so I often recommend to definitely put that on there as well. Now, one thing nice about ZBrush, uh, compared to some other applications, uh, Sometimes if you have a lot of transparent objects and you try to overlay them on top of each other, you'll reach a limit, right? So if you have something where you have like topology, 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 at a certain point, it's usually done through uh, GPU processes. Um, your sample rate won't be high enough to support it. And you'll end up getting at some point where you'll get this black background will come back, right? So you'll have transparent, trans transparent, transparent, and then all of a sudden you'll have one that's black. And that's just because your sample rate usually isn't high enough to sample back through those transparent uh, objects enough. Inside of ZBrush, you don't really ever have to worry about that. You can populate something with a million of these things and it's always gonna render correct. Um, so that's another benefit here in terms of that. You don't have to really worry about sample rates. Like if you wanna have a forest of these things and it's just like a thousand planes lined up, you're gonna be able to see through them and it's gonna give you this effect. So now that I have my little sample here, what I wanna do is I'm gonna undo back to just one of these is I just wanna create a new instrument mesh brush with this, right? And the key to this is when you create an instrument mesh brush with a texture, the main thing here that's gonna go associated with it is that this texture itself is going to um, have a set of UVs and the UVs are gonna be stored into that brush and then the texture uh, will go along with it. So I'm gonna take this here and I'm gonna to go to the brush pad over here and I'm gonna create insert mesh brush and do new. And so now I have my foliage here and now I could use this just as you would a normal insert mesh brush. Now you'll see if I drag this out on this plane here, this is what I'm getting, right? I'm just getting this only coming out with a plane. I'm not getting that texture applied. So you wanna make sure your object has UVs on it when you do this process if you're just using it as an insert mesh brush. So if I go to my plane 3D here and I drag this out, 
turn a texture on here. Now you'll see I'll be able to draw it out. So one thing with an insert mesh brush, just like we had with Bean, you have to have a surface that has a texture map applied to use an insert mesh brush with a texture map. And with the Bean, you have to have a surface with poly paint active to use a insert mesh brush with poly paint. And then the insert mesh brush with poly paint too also needs to have your RGB intensity set to zero. So <laughs> there's some Ask uh, ZBrush videos on that, on how to use insert meshes with texture. So if you need more information, that's, I could go and talk for that for a, a little ways here, but we're gonna try to refrain from today. So I'm gonna convert this insert mesh to a nano mesh brush. And now I have a nano mesh brush and it has this part. And now we're gonna go up and we're gonna go to our sphere here. And we're just gonna Z remesh this quickly. Make it a little bit lower. Um, one thing nice about Zero Mesher 2, after you run it once, you can activate this half option and then keep running it and it'll get your mesh lower and lower and lower. I just want it big enough to kind of see here. And then I'm gonna do insert nano mesh and poly and boom, look at that. Now I've got the sphere and I've gone through and I've populated it with that nano mesh part that contained that texture. And so now I have Veggie Ball, right? I don't know why that name popped in my head, but that's, that's what you guys get today. It is called the Veggie Ball. Now I can turn off Show Placement, and now I can just see that as a pure object. And now, once again, I go to like Move, Scale, or Rotate, and I can start pulling these out, and you'll see it's gonna start distorting that, right? So this is really fun to play with. So now I have Random forest, right? Random plant life I can populate my scene with. Now this is growing and shrinking because I have um, some, the size of the polygons are getting larger. So definitely come in here and change the size of these. I can turn on random distribution, which is also gonna change that effect. So now it won't change the entire process. So now as needed, it will kind of add topology through there. And then see, so you can see like tons of these are overlapping and all this is, is that plain 3D object or that plain object that has those two triangles, four points. And you can see that this does not look, like I've increased this from looking as simplistic as it was, and now it looks like this. All right, let's look at these questions quick, let's drink some water, and then we're gonna go and we're gonna try to sculpt an elephant. So Saeed's asking is the way to create a fiber mesh from a custom mesh. So what you can do with that is you can micro mesh with fiber mesh. And then with that, you can populate the fibers with a micro mesh. So it kind of give you this kind of similar effect. Um, do a search for as ZBrush um, micro mesh. Yeah, just do a search for that. Um, there's one on there where I go through a process of how to do it. Uh, there's also a demo file. If you come up here to project, and then go to, is it miscellaneous? Miscellaneous, there's a micro mesh one right here. And that will kind of show you how it's working too. So basically it's a fiber mesh object. And then instead of populating the fiber surface with a fiber, it's populating with a micro mesh. And the micro mesh, when it's attached to a fiber, will allow it to extend past the polygon borders. So it won't be restricted to a single poly. So you could have that strip of fiber and you could have one single micro mesh and one single piece of geometry go from one end to the other end across multiple points and then you get one long strip. So for this one here, when you render it, it's gonna look like a plant. Um, and so that's using the micro mesh functionality. So nano mesh is the upgraded version of micro mesh, um, but micro mesh has that ability with fiber mesh that would allow you to get some cool results. And there's, a, there's definitely an Acid ZBrush video on that. Uh, so Meckles asking, do you have a tutorial on how to capture those plant textures and bring it into ZBrush? I've tried it, my quality has been mediocre. So the main thing with this is um, there wasn't really any tricks. So if you have, it depends on what resolution you took the image at. So for the ones I have here in this texture area, um, they're all shot on an old uh, Canon. And so we're looking at, uh, I wanna say eight megapixels is what I shot these at. And basically just the quality of your lighting is gonna be your big thing. So if you can do them on an overcast day, that's gonna be your best lighting. So you don't have any harsh shadows kind of interfering with them. Um, so I took them on an overcast day. I just took them on a green screen and that was just for ease of uh, grabbing. 
And then I just import them into Photoshop and I basically just uh, cut out the background. I mean, there's, there's no other real like tricks other than that. And then after I did that, um, I go in and I make sure the images are square formatted. And this just makes it easier. So if I apply it to something inside of ZBrush, I know that if I apply it to a uh, square object, it's gonna come in at the same ratio. And then I don't have to worry about that texture being distorted. So that could be one thing too, if you have you know, elongated surfaces and you apply them to whatever size mesh you have, um, it could make squish or stretch them, and then that could stretch out those pixels and make it look bad too. Um, so I usually end up always going to like a square format for those. And then for saving them, these are just saved out as your normal, um, just 8-bit format, RGB. And then I save them out as PSDs instead of uh, JPEGs just so they don't get compression. And then just import those in, that's it. So quality-wise, it could just be your source material. It could also be that you're running it through, say, a JPEG compression or something like that that could be deteriorating your final result. But ZBrush will accept PSDs, no problem. Um, so you can just send, save them out as PSDs. And then these are just saved out as 1024 by 1024, 512 by 512, or 2048 by 2048. Uh, yes, you can make the uh, the leaf double-sided and so that way it won't uh, be black and that's just done in down here in the uh, display properties and So the in the nano mesh whatever you have it set is going to determine that so for these leaves here It's already turned on right so if I want to change that I can go to the nano mesh area here I can go to edit mesh and then in here it should be turned on let's try this There you go, that should be double-sided. That will control the uh, double-sided nature of it. So you just take the index you're on, go to Edit Mesh, and then down in that Display Properties, turn Off or On, Double, and then when you get out of Edit Mesh and get back to your Nano Mesh, it should now look like that. Now, lighting, definitely if you, if you render and you have something that's uh, fully, you know, it's still gonna see the normals of this shape as being uh, that flat polygon. So definitely if you do like some crazy lighting, in here and you have it coming from one side, if it's gonna cast shadows, remember it's, it's definitely gonna cast, uh, there's no gradient value in there because it's just flat. And so you could still get some black rendering artifacts if you render. Uh, is nano mesh good for making fur, especially for games? Um, usually for that, fiber mesh is gonna bring a better bet or VDM brushes, um, depending which way to go. I mean, you can play with it and see if you can get it out. I've never used it specifically for fur. Anytime I did fur for game stuff, um, it was usually fiber mesh, or I'd end up using um, kind of place geometry. Like I'd have like a strand and then place it all over the place. So Edge Extrude, the demo will be on uh, Restream too, so it'll show up again on uh, YouTube, so you can always tune in and rewatch it. And we get we got some. A little more of the stream left here. We got a little time left, so I'm gonna sculpt some other stuff and we'll place with more of this uh, nano mesh here. Uh, we got a question, do you bake the normals height maps to give them texture or a 3D feel? You can, the only thing with that is you will not get it inside of ZBrush. So ZBrush is always, for this, most of the processes in here, it's going to work primarily on just a diffuse texture. So this is just the diffuse map here. You do have the ability to do normals and displacements inside of ZBrush, but the um, visibility of those will not be um, visible. So it's not gonna give you, say, like a PBR textured material where you have those surfaces applying to give you a result. So right now, this mesh is purely just RGB. But if you had it generated out, you could swap the texture and get a version of it, but you won't be able to see those uh, maps processes combined inside of ZBrush. So if you have a mesh and you have three maps, uh, albedo, um, spec or say you have an albedo, a specular, a normal map, and a bump, um, you're not gonna be able to view those all at the same time on your mesh. Uh, you'll only be able to have one. So web etching is asking you have multiple textures on nano mesh. You'll only be able to have one at a time. But you can do different indexes and then apply different textures there. So with the, let's see, let's get through. Let's sculpt a little quick elephant here. And then we'll talk about how you can do different indexes with these different materials and some of the things that come into play with that too. So I'm going to come back to my... 
poly mesh through here. We're just going to reset this quick. And we had a question earlier about the um, kind of starting base meshes for characters. So this, I'm just going to go through the quick process of this using uh, Sculptors Pro and this sphere here. So this is just a DynaMesh sphere. So I went into Lightbox by pressing comma. And then I just selected the 128 sphere here and loaded this in. And now for this, I'm going to switch to the snake hook brush, which is one of my go-tos here. I'm going to make sure I have symmetry turned on and I'm kind of looking at the front of the model here. And the snake hook brush allows you to pull the surfaces out. So you're talking about, you know, having trouble with form, kind of finding form or getting a feel for it. Uh, this brush is definitely awesome for uh, getting this kind of stuff. And one thing you can do with this is that you can activate Sculptors Pro and this will allow you to pull your form out and as you pull it out, it's going to tessellate or divide the model. So if I wanted to make, you know, some sort of elephant creature here, I can start pulling this out and then let's say I want to give him like a tail, right? So if I do this normally and I pull it out, this is what I'm going to get. All right, so as I pull the surface out, I don't really have enough topology on the mesh at the moment to support that change. And so what happens is I get this. Now you may like this triangle stuff because it does give some cool, uh, cool results sometimes, but this is just a big mess right now. And this is definitely not giving me an elephant tail. So instead of doing that, I can activate Sculptures Pro. And now when I pull out that part there, you'll see it's gonna add topology as I pull it out. And I can keep going and going and going and basically add that surface there. So it's not gonna triangulate that mesh. So this is one thing that's really easy to kind of use to start pulling out forms, right? So I can just do this and now I've started out with my base mesh shape, right? So this is just activating Sculptures Pro and then pulling the model out. Now you're gonna see me model a random elephant here. <laughs> you saw, you guys saw how my, uh, my sculpting went for the, uh, the mug last week. I swear I can sculpt. It's just this under pressure. I'm under pressure in the streams. I want to talk and I want to show you guys cool tricks. And then I feel that everyone can sculpt. So it's just like, this is like the boring part. Oh, he's sculpting again for four hours. But we're going to get some sort of random elephant here. Look at that. I'm looking like a hot mess. <laughs> But this is a way you can kind of build base meshes uh, really quick, and this is just using Sculptors Pro. And so this is the default settings for this. Um, I'll sometimes go in and change my defaults too, so that when I smooth, it doesn't do a uh, undivide. All right, when I smooth, it undivides, but when I add, it doesn't undivide. But you can see I can just come in and quickly make some mess here. And this is just all just using that snake hook brush. So I haven't deviated from this brush yet. And I'm just using it here in kind of this like weird wiggle fashion to get some more weight to those feet. And then I'll go in and say, use the clay buildup brush. Oops, switched my color there. And then with this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of do a weird kind of cross hatching with my brush strokes, so I'll come in and do this. So I rarely come through and drag a stroke out to get what I want. I'll build it up and then I'll shrink it down. And play with this like so. And this is my basic kind of sculpting kind of flow on stuff that I end up doing. And it turns to this too. So coming next Friday, um, I'll be switching from this kind of ZBrush Live stuff. And we actually have a project stream that I'll be starting on. And so we have some uh, concept artwork that's came from Proco.com. So he's a uh, great YouTube artist and uh, he's been doing all sorts of uh, anatomy and drawing streams. And so we've kind of teamed up with him coming, starting uh, next week, we'll be doing a stream and it'll be based on one of his uh, associates' con concept art. And so you'll get to see me do... I got actually sculpt in that one. <laughs> so I'm a little, bit, a little bit worried that it's going to turn into a disaster. We'll see how it goes. Because usually I sculpt in silence. All 
All right, so we got something like an elephant here. We're going to fill it with leaves anyway. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And one thing with ZBrush too, like, I throw away a lot of stuff I do. <laughs> like, I model a lot of stuff, and then there's probably about 90% of it that never sees the light of day um, just because I don't like it. Um, it's one of those things that I'll go through, and if, if I don't like it, after a while, like even if I'm like spent like a few hours into it, I'll be like, yeah, it's done. And I'll just restart it until I get what I want. So there we go. We got some sort of elephant. And so that's how I usually end up blocking stuff out. Just kind of going back and forth like that. All right, let's see these textures here. Let's see these questions. Uh, Saeed's asking, is there a way to merge two different meshes together by sculptors? So there is not. But I can show you a quick little trip, trick. And this is one that uh, if you ever watch Ashley Adams streams too, she does these as well. She does this little trick as well. So let's say with this elephant here, we're going to get, I want to pull something out and I want it to go back into his body. So if I use that snake hook, and I click and drag it and I do this, you see it's gonna give this kind of result, right? It's going through the mesh and it's not, you know, it's distorting that other part. And so let's say I wanna make something really airy or I wanna have like some sort of like goo on a creature or something like that, some sort of kind of wiry webbing. So the trick you can do for this uh, with Sculptors Pro is first just come through and just mask an area out, right? And this is area is gonna be protected. Now I can say pull out with the snake hook brush and now I can embed into that area. Let me make sure I get my angle right here. And so now it'll let me go through that surface, right? So now I have this loop. Now at this stage, these are still separate. So if I come through and smooth this, you see it's gonna smooth back out. It's not fused. So that's the first approach there. So if you have something you wanna to weld together or you wanna to use, say, the snake hook brush and create some weird surface where it goes into another surface, um, protect the area you wanna to go to, and then you'll be able to pull this mesh into it. Now for the welding aspect of it, Sculptors Pro will not weld. So this is still gonna keep you, keep it detached. It did not fuse this. So at this stage, you have a few options you could do. I could cut off a part and then cut off a part there and then use the bridge curve brush, which is over here. So there's this curved bridge brush and that can fuse two holes together and then I can get that shape. For the other process, since I'm at this kind of level already of what I'm at, I can just Dynamesh, right? So I can come here and Dynamesh and then just re-dynamesh the model, and now that's fused it together, and then I can continue sculpting with Sculptors Pro. So that's the other way to kind of go through and, you know, if you have something you need to weld together and move and you're using Sculptors Pro, just dynamesh, and it's gonna fuse it, and then you just continue sculpting. So that's the, the two kind of processes there. The bridge, curved bridge one would work too, but you'd have to like mask and hide and do some other processes. But basically with Sculptors Pro, you're working on a base mesh or topology anyway, so you're not fully into the, you know, you're not fully loving the topology as it is. So basically just redynameshing it is gonna weld those parts together and then you can just keep sculpting. <laughs> so we have a comment, are we gonna talk about the elephant in the room? No. Frumpy, Frumpy the elephant. We're going with it, pro, we're going with it. So this is, I'm always kind of streaming with a Wacom device. I don't know if this is the, the Wacom stream, but. Um... Okay, so now I got my elephant here and we've done, we're gonna move this little tail out a little bit. And another quick trick here. So his feet, one thing that always bugs me is uh, when I sculpt stuff or I see some other models uh, that other people have done, you know, the, the feet, you know, they, they for me, the, the big thing is like having something like bound or ground to the, the floor. And like this right now <laughs> with the floating foot, it drives me nuts. Uh, so here's a, a quick trick you can kind of do to fix that. And you can just use the uh, clip brush for this. And once again, if you're at this stage where you're just kind of making your mesh, uh, building out a silhouette, you're not really concerned about geometry, the clip curve brush is great. Uh, what it does is it's going to take anything on one side of this curve and it's going to mash it to the other side. So it does have the ability to create some bad ge geometry, especially if you have something that won't collapse directly onto itself. Um, so you could also use the trim curve brush too, which is this other brush right here. 
And what this will do, it'll trim it and then fill it. So you have two different options to do there, uh, clip and trim. And the trim will fill and the clip will smash. So just remember the two differences in that. So for this one, if I do clip, and I can clip the feet here, now you can see they're all kind of nestled on the ground there. But all this did was mush it together. And so it's fine at this model state now, but if I wanted to do even cleaner, I could come and use the trim curve and do that same process. And now it's going to cut it and then fill it. So the topology is going to be a little bit cleaner there. But now my elephant doesn't have round, random uh, web feeding there hanging off in the middle of the world. And Randy's bringing up the slice brush. Sometimes acts like a trim brush. It shouldn't be. <laughs> if it is, you may have found something that should be reported to uh, come up here to the help menu and submitting a ticket to support.pixelagic.com. I'm not sure, Chris, what uh, stream that is. So this is a uh, just developer stream from uh, on Z class on ZBrush Live here. Uh, I'm not sure who else is going on today, but if you go to uh, zbrushlive.com and there's a calendar link now at the top, and in there, there are links to people coming up. Let me actually look really quick. Let's do this really quick. We're gonna try not to double stream here. Cause I'm not, there may be someone going for toy stuff after this. We have a lot of presenters. Let's get the echo out of there. So uh, Sakaki is going after this and he's out of Japan and he does toys. So he'll be going at 6 p.m. Um, LA time tonight. And he's, he's an amazing artist. So definitely if you're looking for toy stuff, um, at least on our channel, uh, check out his streams too. He is Japanese, but it, um, so there will be, usually there's a translator in the stream with him. So if you have questions, uh, you, he can answer them for you. But his work's amazing. So I'd definitely check that out. All right, so now I got my elephant, and now let's reduce some polygons on them. So I went through and I sculpted this quick, and basically I'm just looking for a silhouette, right? So I could have gone back in and I could make this, you know, better. He's not the greatest elephant. Um, there's a lot of anatomy issues here, but we're going for something that would be in the yard, <laughs> covered in leaves anyway. So I just need like a base form. Like you can read this from far away that, hey, yeah, that's probably an elephant. You know, we're, we're not going to get mistake for a dog, so I think, I think we're good. So now I'm gonna to go to the geometry tab over here and I'm gonna zero mesh this. And I just wanna go through and this is just gonna reprocess it with lower topology because right now it's still a little dense. And so for using any sort of um, nano mesh functionality on this, I wanna make sure it's not too heavy because I'm applying this part to individual surfaces. So I'm gonna come over here and click zero mesh and process this. And so we're now at that level. So we can go a little bit lower than that. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do half and zero mesh again. Another nice thing with uh, zero mesher is that oftentimes it'll clean up any uh, kind of messy sculptural stuff too. So you can see if I run this a few times, now my, now my elephant's looking a little bit smoother. And then just to kind of preview what it would look like if it had subdivisions on it, I could turn dynamic. And you can see it's kind of cleaned up a little bit. So you can definitely use uh, zero mesh to clean up sculpts too, and it'll give you a nice kind of smoothing effect, but it's gonna be like a topology smooth rather than like a sculptural smooth. It's great for uh, cloth sculpting. So what you can do for like any of that stuff is if you have some cloth, you can just quickly rip in some wrinkles, like large scale, like wrinkle stuff, and then run zero mesh on it. <laughs> it's gonna go through and follow them nice, and then you can apply some subdivisions on it, and it'll end up looking a lot better. Um, and you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, messing with that stuff. All right, so now that I got my mesh here, now let's create some of our insert my parts and his head is killing me here. We have to widen this out a little bit. There you go, that's a little better. That was bugging me. So this is, this is where I get, I lose track of time because I come in and I start doing this. I just start seeing things that are like, yeah, that's not, that's not it. That's not it. All right, <clears throat> so now that I got my elephant, I got my base. We're gonna go up here and we're gonna quick save quick. Now I'm gonna make a few uh, parts for nano meshing. 
And with Nano Mesh, we talked about earlier how it's working on instancing. And so if you're doing foliage stuff like this, this is a key thing to remember. Because basically, any Nano Mesh index you have, um, it's gonna always check to see if another index has the similar point count and similar shape in order to cut down on memory usage. So if I have a plain 3D object that is just those four outer points, and then I have that on instance one and I have one texture applied to it, if I apply that with a different texture on index two, ZBrush is gonna see both of those, and since they can stay in that same geometry, it's gonna go, oh, this is the same one you already used. Well, we can use, just use the instance of that again and reduce memory. However, in this case, since I'm just applying textures, that texture isn't looked at, and so, if I had two surfaces that had different textures on it, but the geometry is the same, and I go to apply them, I'm only gonna get one texture out of it. So we're gonna go through and we're going to uh, set up some plain 3D objects so we can create an instant mesh brush and then create a nano mesh brush, but we're gonna modify the topology on our plain 3D brush objects slightly between each, each texture so that ZBrush doesn't see them as a pure geometry inst instance uh, surface. So I'm gonna come over here and grab the plain 3D one over time here and turn on polyframes. And for this, we're just gonna make a few of these. So the first one we're gonna do just straight out 2-2-H divide. And I'm gonna turn and make poly mesh 3D on. And now there we have that object there. And now this is just my plane here. Now I wanna create another one of these. So I'm gonna click duplicate. In here, just to quickly do this, I could go to the initialize menu and change the divides every single time. Um, but I don't want really to really do that because it's gonna take a little time to process. So I'm gonna come over here and turn off SMT and divide once on the second one and then click delete lower. So now this is plane one. So this just has four points. Plane two has nine points. Duplicate again, now I got plane three. And then divide that one and then delete lower. So that one has 25 points. So now I have four, nine, 25. And then we'll duplicate this one more time. And we're going to now um, divide this one and then we'll delete lower on that. And so now we have 81. So right now, all these planes of geometry have different vertex counts, right? And this is a key thing here because when we're using the animesh indexes, if the, usually if you just use normal index insert meshes, um, you're never gonna run into this problem. But if you end up using things with just textures applied to a plane, um, you're gonna, you need to make sure the geometry that's applied to this is different, okay? Because if it's not, then ZBrush is, the nano mesh is gonna see that as the same piece of geometry that's in another index, and then it's just gonna use that instead to try to save our memory. But if you have a texture applied that you want different, it's not gonna work. So now that I have my planes here, I'm gonna apply some maps to these. So we're gonna go in here to our texture map area and grab my alpha plants. We're gonna grab our one topiary leaf here and load that in. And I'm just gonna load in a bunch of these. So we're gonna do the next topiary one. So I got two of those. Then this one I wanna load in. I don't know if I'll use it as a nano mesh, but we'll load that in. And then of course we need some sort of flower. I mean, just, just because, right? We'll do, hmm, we'll do the small flower here. All right, so now let's set up our parts here. Now with this too, we kind of just wanna think about how much topology we're gonna to throw at this model too. So this is just, pre-thought kind of stuff. Like you could just go in and do this and hope for the best, but ahead of time, if you're gonna do a lot of this stuff, it's smart to think about, well, which insert mesh model is gonna populate my model the most? And so for this one, it's going to be this one texture, this topiary texture here. I'm probably gonna use that heavily. So I wanna come over here to that subtool, this first one here, and make sure it's the lightest one. So it's the one that's just got four polygons there. I'm gonna go to the texture tab down the bottom here and just link it to that. So now that one is set. I wanna make sure transparency turned on and then also turn on aliasing. Now I'm gonna to go to my second one here. So this is the one that has a little more topology and I wanna link it to this one. So this topiary uh, 04. So I'm gonna come down here to the texture map tab, open this up, grab 04, make sure transparency on, turn on anti-aliasing. Then for this one here, which is the 03 one, We'll have this one be little little white flower. So we'll come down here to texture map tab and select little white flower here. Make sure transparency on, turn on aliasing. 
And then for the last one, we're going to link the uh, one with the veins here. Anti-aliasing, transparent one. And now we have this set up. So now we have in our scene, and we can actually name these two. So we'll do Ivy. I don't even know if that's Ivy. We're just gonna name it. We'll do that one taupe. This one will be a little flower. And then this one will be, and there we go. All right, so now I got these. I'm gonna get out of solo here and make sure these are all positioned in my scene like this. I'm gonna to go to the brush palette over here and go to create insert mesh. Oh, nope, not create insert mesh. Create insert multi mesh. Now this insert multi mesh option became enabled because I had more than one subtool. So if I only had one subtool in my scene, it would only just give me the insert mesh. But since I have multiples, I can apply all these at the same time into a brush. So I can take all these subtools and turn them into one insert mesh brush. So I'm gonna click this. And now I should have an insert mesh brush that contains these parts. Now, I want, once again, I wanna convert this to a nano mesh brush. So I'm gonna brush palette up here, convert to nano mesh. And now I have a nano mesh brush with those parts. So now I go back to my elephant here. And let's check out these questions here. So we are hanging in there with the lockdown. I end up working remotely uh, as it is. So I'm out here in North Carolina. Our headquarters are in LA and we have people all over the world um, that kind of work remotely as well, even before the lockdown happened. Um, it's been a little chaos on my end because now I don't have my lockdown, my normal space to myself. I have a lot of people in it. Um, so it's definitely, uh, it's, I think it's more chaos <laughs> than normal. Um, I'm used to seeing like myself and my dogs for like most of the day. And now I see like both my kids all day and everything else. So it's, it's a little chaos, but we're all doing well. Um, web etching is asking what's the adapted functionality do underneath ZBrushmesher. So if you have anything inside of ZBrush you have questions on, you can definitely hover over it and hold down the control key and it will give you some information on this. Um, I bring this up because the adaptive one is basically going to look at the polygons and try to adapt uh, the base uh, geometry around it. But this will give you a little more um, detail on that. So if you just hold down control across anything inside the interface, you can get more information on it. And so there's the one for the adaptive skin. Um, the adaptive process, but basically it's just going to look at, at it and it's going to try to adapt the size to fit stuff. And if it's not exact, it's going to be okay. So it's giving it more freedom to process your model. Uh, Edge Extrude is asking, is there a poly limit with zero measure? So there is a limit for what you can get to, but um, you should be able to change it uh, to what you want. So this, um, where are we at here? If you turn off half, you can adjust this. And so it will go to 100,000 polygons is what that is. So there is a limit on that. So it's 0 0.1 to 100,000. Because basically zero mesher is made to generate a new kind of low res topology on your mesh. And then after you have it low res, you can divide it up. But basically it's, it's processes to take your model and reduce it rather than add stuff to it. Uh, Randy Dice, yes, I should have added double-sided as well. I can add that later. We'll do that here in a second. All right, so now that I got my elephants and I got my insert mesh brush, I can now start adding some of this topiary to here. So I'm gonna select my Ivy one first, and with this, I wanna populate the entire mesh, right? So I'm gonna click and drag and hold shift, and you see now it's gonna flood the entire model with that topiary, right? So now I can go to the nano mesh area here. I can now come in here and click on show placement and this is gonna give me this result. I can turn off show placement, there you go. And now I see those leaves coming through. I can now go to edit mesh and make sure the double-sided option is turned on. So I see front and back on my object there. And now I should have this. And now I can come in here and start playing with the size of these and then also how many of these I want. So if I just apply it normally, it's applying it right now to every single face on this elephant, right? So this is why, once again, I chose the small size portion of um, geometry that we made with the sensor mat brush because I knew it was gonna be applied everywhere, right? And with this, if I wanna reduce this down so it's not coming across every single polygon, you can apply this random distribution and this will lighten that load a little bit. So this is definitely doesn't need to go across 
every single poly. So just applying some random distribution is already gonna cut down how many of those are gonna be applied. And then after that's applied, it can scale it up or down to kind of get that feeling a little bit different, right? And then I can add some uh, you know, variation to this. Right now, the variation on this is, is pretty good um, because basically you know, that pattern I have applied to it has already got a sense of noise to it or a noise quality to it. So as it's across the entire surface, you're not really seeing that pattern defined as it's a repeating shape. It's giving you almost that random effect. But if you want to add more, now we can come through and play with these rotation angles, kind of see what it's kind of giving me on any of these. And then adding this variation option here will give you some different roughness on their shapes. And so definitely I'd always add uh, a little bit of this because now we're getting that, well, the gardener kind of mixed that area there or he didn't cut that one fully. Um, so definitely you can add that little kind of surprise happy accidents there. Now, another thing with the variation sliders, um, if you come over here and say, I set the width to uh, all, width, length, and height are all the same value. If you start activating these sliders, this is gonna do kind of a uniform scale across it. Um, so you'll get the pieces going, you know, at the same resolution. If you have any offsets and numbers over here, it's gonna do kind of an ununiform scale. So one little thing there too, in terms of this, if you start messing with it and you're like, well, I just want, them, I just want some that are smaller maybe. I don't really want them longer, I just want them globally smaller. Um, so just make sure that all these numbers match if you want that to happen. Now, as you change these, you're gonna see this mesh update on the fly too. So you can just kind of come through and play with it until you get something you like and you size it up and down. So you really have a lot of freedom and kind of control um, with this. If you make an accident, you can always undo it too. And so now we've got my elephant here and he's looking more topiary formed. Now at this stage, I can also modify him too. So I can go back to say that move brush. If you add geometry to this, it's gonna change the amount of stuff that's gonna be applied. So I could definitely take this model and divide it. But just remember when you divide it, it's adding more polygons. Now it's gonna keep the same poly group, but it's gonna add more polygons. And so it's gonna increase the amount of nano meshes that are applied. And so if I came up here and say, went to divide and click divide, you see now my nano meshes are getting smaller because it's added more topology to it. But you can definitely uh, manipulate the mesh even to the extent of dividing it to increase the amount of polygons on a mesh. And then moving stuff around, as you can see, will distort that underlying structure so I can manipulate my elephant a little bit more. Maybe his ears weren't as visible in a uh, topiary area form here. And you can start getting, you know, really crazy with this. Maybe one is, you know, tail to do something different. And this is just me performing a move and then it's just affecting that nano mesh as well. Now with my elephant here, I can now start adding those other elements to it. So maybe I want to add that other option or the other uh, topiary form on it too. So with this, I'm gonna go back here and I'm just going to locate, put show placement back on so I can see the mesh underlying it and turn my polyframes on. And I just wanna go back to that brush that I created. So this is the one with the ivy and stuff here. I'm gonna select the other topiary here. And I'm gonna hover across the polys and I hold, click and drag and hold shift, which is gonna apply it to everywhere. And since I already had it applied to everywhere with that other one, this is just applying it an additional to it. So it's applying it to the same polygons across everything, and now I just have two nano meshes stuck on every single poly. So now with this, I probably wanna activate that random distribution pretty fast here, and then I can change the size here. And now I've added another element to my elephant here. So I have my initial one, and then I have a secondary one that's coming in. Now this one may be a little bit harder to see because it is definitely um, different, but it looks similar but this can also allow you to play with the ones now. So this could be my random sporadic one that creates the, the tufts that shoot off, you know, like the ones that are starting to grow now, right? Not the old ones. It's not old growth, it's new growth, right? So I can come through here and I can change my offset on this and figure out which one is the correct one here. So this is Z1. And I can, you can type in values for all these two. If you type in any values into the uh, sliders, just make sure you hit enter after it. And so now I have those ones are now coming in and they're adding this stuff, right? So they're adding this here. If I hide the others, you can see this is what that index looks like. And then this is what my first index looks like. And then combined together, I now have this. So now I'm roughing up that kind of element there. So a little bit more kind of irregularities on that mesh. Now I wanna add in my flowers. So I'm gonna select my flower option here. 
And I'm gonna turn on my show placement again just so I can see that mesh and I can find a poly. Shift and drag on that too, which is now gonna apply that all over there. And I can hide others. You can see this is what it's giving me with all those flowers. Once again, I'm gonna activate random distribution and increase the size on this. And then I'm gonna change the offset too, just so it comes out from the mesh there. And then I'm gonna show all the others and then turn off placement. And so now I have these little flowers coming in too. And so you can see I can keep layering up these different nano meshes to keep getting different results. Now for the last one here for these veins, um, this one's you know just another thing I could add to it. I could also add it as a different element. So let's say I come up here and I now append in just a plain object. And we'll just move that over here and then rotate it. And this is just a single plane object, this is a new subtool, but now I can take that vein and I can apply it to this, right? And so this is what we were talking about earlier using nano meshes um, on just single pieces of geometry. Now I still get the same controllers as I have in the other one, so I can offset this if I want so it's not embedded into that plane. I can also hide the placement. And now I have this as a nano mesh on that, that plane. So now I can use this to maybe establish Maybe I don't want his ears sculpted. Maybe I want him to be these large, gigantic things, right? So I could come in and add this. And then right now, since this is just a plane with a nano mesh on it, I can hold control and duplicate it, and rotate it, position it, and move it around. I'm gonna make another one, say over here. And I can bring it back and see what that looks like. Now I got that kind of ear shape going on with those. And then I can also use, you know, since it is just geometry, it's just a plain piece of geometry. I can use mirror and weld, you know, anything I have in, access to inside of ZBrush. So if I come down to the uh, geometry area and do mirror and weld, I can mirror it so that these two plain geometries that have this nano mesh attached, now go to the other side. Oh, and I guess for some reason it's telling me I don't have any polygons. There we go. Oh, it's because of masking. Remember to unmask. And get out of man mesh. There we go, all right. <laughs> and then we also wanna turn on our back face masking too. So I'm gonna edit mesh, go down to the display properties, turn on double. And now I have both those ears and there we've got our little elephant. So there we go. We're gonna quick save that. Now is bonus material, and then we'll get these questions quick, and then I think we're gonna be out of stream time today. Um, I have some other ones that I've kind of done quickly to kind of show you. Topiaries, we, we just got, we got hit with topiaries today. But you can also render these is the other thing, and you can use the BPR filters with this. And so we had a whole thing on BPR filters, but these are a lot of fun um, in terms of rendering stuff too. So if I render this, Let me turn off my polyframes. We'll do that one more time. You can see this is the result I'm getting. So I'm not getting any of those weird kind of uh, areas on the mesh that are calling out black because I don't have enough samples. Like ZBrush will just render it all. And so this is actually, you know, all the way through, you can see that I have those leaves built in. And all this is was a leaf that was on that single plane and then I've just applied it to that quickly sculpted uh, elephant and now I get this result. And now I can add filters to this so if I go to Lightbox and go to the filter over here, I'm gonna choose Render Set this time. So the difference between filters and Render Set is that filters is gonna apply the uh, process here in the filters to your current render settings. And then Render Set is gonna give you new render settings and then also apply the filter. So if you want exactly what the filter is supposed to look like and be used with, uh, you probably wanna use Render Set. The only problem with Render Set is it's gonna to have to render with BPR again before giving you the result. So it's a little bit slower than just going through and slamming uh, different filters in the filter area. But now I can say, come in and grab, say this watercolor one. And let me set my background here to something like white. This one should get me a better result here. That was a little noisy. I swear I did some testing on these. And if I have my floor grid on, this will also give me a little shadow here. It 
Should be giving me shadows. I'm, I'm bringing you all lies today. But you can see even just doing this, now I've got a totally different look to the model. Something that could be almost, um, you know, stylized out of something else. Like if you were doing like an illustration for a children's book, right? All I did was quickly make this, add some topiary stuff, which is just images applied to planes that were now coming across the surface. And then now I've just rendered it in, uh, with an NPR filter and we're done. And that was what, 30 minutes, a little bit less than 30 minutes. So just think of ways like to use ZBrush that, you know, aren't your typical ones or like ways to speed up processes you may do that may have taken you a long time before. Um, there's definitely a lot of stuff in there because now that it's 3D, you know, I can change my angles and everything else. And I did a whole uh, Z Classroom Live on the uh, filter stuff too, on creating shapes like that, but it's, it's fun to play with pretty much anything you kind of make. So the topiary creation here. <laughs> there's also a render set in here that will return you to default too. So you can click that and get back to where you were originally as well. And that'll bring me back to my original, well, it should bring back to my original um, elephant here. So fun times, fun times. All right, let's set up these questions quick. It does look like a Chia pet, totally does. Uh, so web etching, you're asking, after I zero mesh model, do I still need to re-topologize in Maya or not? So the, it depends. Um, it depends what you're doing with the model at the end result. So zero mesher is going to give you a single one click solution and it's very fast. So this is the thing here, very fast. It takes you one click. It may not give you the exact topology you want for a game resolution asset. Um, and definitely if you're trying to get a job in the game industry, they're probably gonna want you, they're gonna ask you, you know, hey, was this zero mesh or did you do it by hand? Cause there's kind of like this getting into like, it's kind of a hurdle you kind of got to pass and that's, you need to be able to do some manual topology. Um, so in a learning sense, I wouldn't say that zero mesh is your answer for everything, um, but it does give you a great start on a lot of things. Uh, and with it, you can also edit the topology it gives you. You can use even use Z-spheres to edit it. And then with that, you can then manipulate it to fit exactly what you want. So zero mesh will give you a head start and then you can go in and chop out parts you don't want and rebuild them say with the Z modeler brush or um, uh, use the Z-sphere uh, retopology stuff and fix those up. So in terms of speed, it's a huge time saver. Um, but as it, is it the end result? Not always, um, but sometimes it can be. It just depends what you're doing. Uh, Saeed's asking, can we use the nano mesh created and if it's texturing other softwares like Maya? So after you convert it, it will go anywhere you want. So if I take my object here and I would, was to convert it, um, basically for this one, for the nano mesh, the, the one thing if you're gonna convert this is you have to remember that each of these different parts had a different texture on it. Um, and so ZBrush as a subtool sense can only have one texture applied to one subtool at a time. So you'd have to use, you know, before when I was converting this, I was using BPR to Geo. For this one, you'd want to use probably this one to mesh and convert that part and then break it off in its own subtool. And then do one to mesh again, convert that in text, break it out in its own subtool. One to mesh for the last, the second, the next to last one, convert it to its own subtool. And that would give you four subtools with each one of those subtools having a different nano mesh part. And then after it has that nano mesh part, then you link it to the correct texture and then it will look the way you want it to be. Um, so you can definitely get it out, but just remember that there is a limitation in ZBrush where a single subtool um, can only have one texture applied to it. And so since this model right here has four textures applied to it, if it went down to one, it wouldn't be able to you know, accept those textures um, instantly. So you'd have to separate it out. Uh, Edge Extreme is asking, do nano mesh planes orient from mesh center or is it a way to force orientation? So in general, they're gonna do it from the center of the poly is where they're gonna come out of. So the nano mesh, when you, when you actually, when you generate the insert mesh brush, it's going to take the mesh you have and it's going to center it. So yes, it's always gonna be centered based in a space. So it's basically going to take your object. Let's go back up here, like this Ivy here. Let's change my background back to gray. And when I create this, right, even if it's over here, even if it's down here, even if it's somewhere over here, it's gonna frame around what it captures. 
Okay, so that's all these insert meshes are always going to frame around what it captures. It's also not going to hold the scale of your mesh. So if you have a part, or you have a bunch of parts and they're all sized correctly over here, when you create that insert mesh brush, it's basically going to take that shape, unify it to the ZBrush world, and then put it in the brush. And then it's going to go to the next one. Unify it, brush. Unify it, brush. So all the scales on those are going to be fit to the same size. And that's the same thing it's doing with this. Now, once you create this in an instrument mesh brush, it's just holding those same dimensions. But then when you apply it to your object, um, what you can do to offset it is in the nano mesh index area, you have these uh, offset options right here, and you can offset in X, Y, and Z, which will force it off the center of that poly. Um, so if you're not using random distribution, um, it's gonna draw it out of that single poly, and then you can use those offsets to offset it in one of those directions off the polygon. But it will, if you don't have random distribution, it will do the nano mesh on the center of the poly. And then when the object is captured, it's always going to grab the extents of that object and unify it and put it in the brush. Uh, so Randy, yeah, so for this, you'd want to convert your mesh. Um, so if I do come over here, we'll just see if it works really quick here. We'll do one to mesh, one to mesh, one to mesh. And so now I've converted all those. And all these, well, let's try that again. Let's do one to mesh. So we got my first one converted. Now what I want to do with this is I want to select it. So I'm going to go to my select rectangle brush and grab it. Come on now. And then I'm going to flip the... Hold on, hold on. We're going to make this work. Let's turn show placement. So this is my first set here. Now I want to split these off in their own tool. So split, split hidden. Now I'm back to my elephant here with its nano meshes. I'm going to convert the next one. So one to mesh. I'm going to isolate that part. And then we're going to split hidden. So now we have that. Go back to my elephant. In here, turn nano mesh on, one to mesh. There's that part. Select that part, split hidden. And then we have our base here, and this one should be all done with nano meshes. Okay, so now I have each of these broken out, right? So they were all those plain objects, they were nano meshes. I've now broken them out into three different subtools. And now with these, I just need to come through and reapply the texture. So if I come down to this one, go to texture map, select topiary first one. Oh, I failed. I failed. I forgot I need to apply a texture to my mesh first. Anyhow, <laughs> um, the main process here is that first make sure that you have a texture map applied to your initial shape. So come through and just apply Anything, if it, basically, if you're detaching stuff off, you need to make sure you have a UV set of coordinates because when it attaches, it's gonna ignore the UV set of coordinates. Um, I'm pretty sure there's an Ask ZBrush video on this too. Um, but basically, for this uh, elephant here, before I did the one to mesh, what you'd wanna do is you'd wanna come down here to create and just throw a PUV or UV tiles on it. Um, and that will just make sure that it has a set of UVs. Then when you do the one to mesh, it would detach that part off and it would retain the UVs that it has on it and then you can apply the texture back to it, and then you can take that through all the processes and export them into Max or Maya. Um, but for the main part, Nano Mesh is only gonna give you the instant sense inside of ZBrush, and if you're using this texture uh, solution here, um, you're gonna have to convert the meshes first, and then make sure when you convert them that you have a texture map applied to your base model. So if you did not do that, then that is what you would've got here, where I have these shapes, but they're all um, separated. Now you could probably get away with doing something like um, AUV tiles here, which would give me a map on that. Let me get my topiary on here. And one of these would probably end up, yeah, I'd have to go back to my, my save. But yes, that is, you can do it. I just did it incorrectly. <laughs> so sorry about that. And I, I don't think I have my, I don't remember the last time I quick saved here. May have it, let's see. Let's see, let's see how far back this is. This is far back enough, I'll at least break one off so you guys can see this. Yeah. 
right, let's see how far my elephant is. Let's see. We'll do this quick. Okay, we're, we're still good here. All right, so I'm going to make some just UV mapping on that. And now I've got my uh, elephant here. And now I should be able to go to the nano mesh and do one to mesh. And now, hopefully, I don't think I lied to you again. Split hidden. Now apply that, and there you go. And it should have actually been this one. So that is the process on what you need to do to get it from one to mesh if you have texture maps on it. So first make sure that your base mesh has UV coordinates, just apply something quick, it doesn't matter, you're not keeping them. Um, and then with the nano mesh, pick the one you want. So this one is the one here, and if I just show that, this is the one I got right now. Do one to mesh, after it's one to meshed, hold down control and shift and isolate it, and then do split hidden. And then after it's split out like this, now go down to the texture map tab down here and select the image and then that'll populate. And then we can do our last one as well. So this one here, one to mesh, make sure it's the only thing there it should be. We'll do a split hidden and then apply the texture map to that. And so now I have true geometry for these parts. So I've got this one, this one, and this one, and that's getting my elephant there. Also make sure that if you uh, did not have back face masking turned on, that you turn it back on. You can also cycle through subtools by pressing down arrow, which is handy, especially if you just need to come through and do something simple like this. And there we now have the elephant. It now has a texture map applied and it's just geometry. So you could export out each of these to Max or Maya and then, um, link that texture to it and you'd get the same result. So there you go. We resolved the issue I had. So just make sure your mesh that you've applied the nano meshes to has UVs if you're going to uh, use the one mesh process to break those out into a new subtool. All right, I think that's it. Uh, Damien, uh, can you send that link again? We can, we can try to do it quick. Damon's asking if I can show how to nano mesh a hex structure. So more than likely it's gonna be, um, here, we'll, I'll pull up this thing here. Z classroom. Let's see, this is probably gonna be even better than me kind of going through this stuff here. Um, so in here there is a example with doing uh, the webbing basically let me find it here for a micro mesh hood. And so this sounds like what you're kind of looking for. Um, so basically this is the same kind of premise that would be used with um, the nano mesh functionality. So it makes you have even topology. Then you would make need to make a piece of geometry that would go out to the extents of the side. So it could be mirrored top to bottom because basically after you uh, generate the mesh itself in that structure, you want to make sure you can weld those parts together to create that knit. And so this one's going to go through and it will explain how to do it with a, uh, with micro mesh, which is going to give you the similar result to, uh, that nano mesh is doing. Um, and with this, uh, it should cover all the aspects you're kind of looking for Here. on that. So I definitely, uh, do a search for just a micro mesh hood on a Z classroom and follow that and then see if that gives you what you want. But basically the main thing with any of the nano meshes or micro meshes, if you want it to be consistent all the way through, you need to make sure that you set up your topology initially so that after it's on, you can weld those ends together and it'll connect. Cause if not, then you're going to have just like little bits of stuff all over the place. Let's look at this. Let's look at what you got here in this hexar. Wait for it. Yeah, so this, you would have to make a shape that could be um, come through and cut at this size. And then this could just be your topology. So you can see when you apply the nano mesh, just make sure it's set to fill. And then this shape would fill each one of those parts. But with this, you need to make a uh, pattern that would repeat and weld. Because this is a hex pattern, right? So your geometry would either, would it could take a little while to get your geometry set up where you have a part and a part and a part. Because this isn't, 
you know, normal topology will go like this, right? It's going to go up and down and vertical, and this one's offset. So what you probably have to do is end up uh, doing what I did originally when we were doing that checkerboard type pattern. You may have to do that to actually set up your polygroups and then apply your nano meshes to those different areas. But then you need to make that nano mesh part so that it would actually connect together. It would probably be easier for this one to uh, just make a texture and then uh, use, say, like UV mapping on that helmet and then extend it outward um, using the offset option in surface noise. That would probably be your easiest uh, way there. Nano mesh is going to take a little bit of time, especially to get that pattern. Uh, Mardesh, one last one here. After you make your brush, let's see, let's go in here and go to a curve brush. So Mardesh is asking, uh, after I made a curve brush, I tried to make a rope with three cylinders and after drawing it, they're not connected. So last question here really quick. So for this, what you want to do is if you have an IMM curve brush in the modifier area over here, there is this weld points option. So make sure that is turned on. That's going to be the number one thing that is going to cause it to fail. So that's in brush modifiers and weld points. So make sure that's turned on and I'll try to weld those points. Another thing that would cause it is that if you're doing cylinders and there's no um, divisions in the middle, it will weld, but sometimes it'll weld everything and then you're not gonna get the result you're looking for. So make sure you have a little bit of topology in between those sections. And then also make sure that the sections that you have for those three parts, they have the same number of spans on each of those holes. So like if you have the cylinder, 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 make sure those inner cylinders all have the same number of spans and then try activating that weld points um, and see if that works. All right, well that is it. Thank you all. I'll be back uh, next Friday and we'll be doing a joint kind of thing. I'm gonna actually probably do more sculpting. It's gonna be hard to show tips, not to show tips and tricks and stuff like that. So um, we'll see how it goes, but definitely tune in to that. Uh, we have more streamers coming on. Uh, Paul will be streaming tomorrow, so if you're around on Saturday and you're looking for something to do, he'll be on there. I'm not quite sure what he's going to be covering, but um, he's been doing a lot more of the advanced stuff too inside of ZBrush. So if you have any questions too and looking for solutions, uh, hit him up as well. I think that is it for today. So thank you all. Stay safe and have a good weekend. And until next time, cheers. Bye.